Good evening. Welcome to the Dr. Alan W. Woot Contemporary Art Distinguished Lectureship at the Hood Museum of Art. My name is Taria Adkins. I'm a member of the class of 2020, and I was a homily family in, HAMA family intern during my senior year at the Hood. Currently, I'm living in New York City, and I'm working as a studio assistant for Julie Muratu. At Dartmouth, I majored in studio art, concentrated in painting and printmaking. At this time, I'd like to ask everyone to turn off their cell phones. Please note the emergency exit to my left and at the back of the auditorium. And please keep your masks on. I now invite Samuel Levy, Associate Dean of the Faculty for the Arts and Humanities to the podium. Hi all, it's so wonderful to see everyone in person tonight. So welcome, welcome back. So good evening and welcome to the Dr. Alan W. Root Contemporary Art Distinguished Lectureship. I'm Sam Levy, Associate Dean of the Faculty for the Arts and Humanities and Professor of Philosophy. The Root Lecture was established by Dr. Root's children in honor of their father's 70th birthday. Thank you to Jennifer, Michael, and Jonathan for choosing this gift for your father, which has brought brilliant artists and art historians, critics and curators to campus, enriching the intellectual and cultural life of the hood and the college. Thanks to his family, the annual Root Lectureship has, has been presented since 2004. Dr. Root was a member of Dartmouth's class of 1955 and also of the Dartmouth Medical School. Several children and grandchildren have followed in his footsteps here. I would also like to take a moment to remember the late Janet Root, Alan's wife. Janet was a fierce advocate for the arts and humanities through her work in arts education and leadership on the board of the Dolly Museum in St. Petersburg, Florida. Tonight, I'm so pleased to introduce Julie Maritou, an internationally acclaimed artist whose paintings are prominently placed in major museums around the world. Her mid-career retrospective, co-organized by the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and the Whitney Museum of American Art, is currently at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis and will carry on from there to the High Art Museum in Atlanta. Julie was born in Addis Ababa, attended Kalamazoo College and the University Sheikh Anta Diop in Dakar, Senegal before earning her MFA from the Rhode Island School of Design in 1997. Since then, she has earned major awards and honors, including the MacArthur Fellowship in 2005, the US Department of State Medal of Arts Award in 2015, and this year, membership to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. The Hood Museum and Dartmouth are beyond proud to have Julie's 2018 painting Iridium over Aleppo in the collection and currently on view on the second floor of the museum. Joining Julie, we welcome my colleague, theoretical physicist, Marcelo Gleiser. Marcelo is director for the Institute for Cross-Disciplinary Engagement, which seeks to bridge the sciences and the humanities so that people can cross in both directions and in doing so, enrich themselves and their worldview. He is the Appleton Professor of Natural Philosophy and a Professor of Physics and Astronomy here at Dartmouth College. He received the 1994 Presidential Faculty Fellows Award from the White House, and he was awarded the 2019 Templeton Prize, an honor he shares with Mother Teresa, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, the Dalai Lama, and scientists Freeman Dyson and Martin Reyes. We welcome back Ogachokwo Smooth and Zui internationally exhibited artist, art historian, and the Stephen and Lisa Tannenbaum Curator in the Department of Paintings and Sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. He has curated major international exhibitions, including the Dakar Beniali in Senegal in 2014, and he served on the curatorial team for the 11th Shanghai Biennale in 2016-17, and he has curated the Nigerian Africa Heritage Biennial three times. 
Smooth studied art with El Anatsui at the University of Nigeria in Suku, before earning a PhD in art history from Emory University in 2013. At that point, he joined the Hood Museum, and many of you will recall fondly his exhibitions and acquisitions for the Hood. After leaving the Upper Valley, he worked as a curator at the Cleveland Museum of Art before taking on his current role at MoMA. So with that, I invite you to enjoy our presentation in conversation with Julie Maritou in Artist's Voice. I'm just going to start the presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Levy, for a fantastic um, introduction. Um, sincere gratitude to the Root family for supporting the Hood Museum through the endowed um, Dr. Alan W. Root's Contemporary Arts Distinguished Lectureship. I had a pleasure of giving one in 2013 when I just arrived uh, at, at the Hood. And uh, I remember it with such uh, fond memories I want to thank the Hood, uh, the Hood Museum, the organizers of this event, uh, Director John Stoneberg, who is unable to join us. Uh, Sharon, uh, who has been an important liaison, and a host of former colleagues that I've been fortunate to see again. I'm looking at, I'm seeing Enri Enrique at the back, and then a few other people. So it's really, really, really thrilling to be back in, in Hanover and in the new Gilman Auditorium. But even more significant uh, is the pleasure of serving as an, an interlocutor um, in this evening's conversation. Uh, Julie's a dear friend, and I like to describe her as a force of nature. <laughs> she is an incredible humanist, uh, guided by her convictions uh, that art can serve the greater good. Her multi-layered and multi-faceted uh, paintings are such of meaning to borrow Professor uh, Glazer's phrase. They probe the scale of human history and the depth of the history of art, addressing topics ranging from colonialism, pan-Africanism, diaspora, blackness, war, migration, displacement, and geopolitics through the language of abstraction. And so what you see today as we talk is um, Julie's work um, in a loop and then we'll talk through the work. Um, Professor Levy mentioned the, uh, the Iridomova Lepo uh, acquired by the Hood in 2018. So it's a key work that responds to the civil war in Syria, uh, combining press photos and architectural drawings of built structures of Aleppo and the city of Homs, rendered in abstraction and explosive uh, marks. And so Julie specially requested to have Professor Glazer joined her in conversation because of a shared interest in cosmology, world building, mapping, mythology, but all centered around storytelling. And so it's such a delight to have uh, Professor Marcelo, uh, who's no stranger to most of you, uh, in his own turf. <laughs> I mentioned to Marcelo uh, a few days ago that it's, it was a shame that we never met each other when I, during my time here. But um, I've been reading up on his scholarship on science and philosophy and in the ways in which we can think of science as a narrative that we construct to explain what we can do, to explain what we can of the natural world. Uh, one can also say that art is a narrative that we construct uh, to condense reality. And I think that's sort of the connection between uh, Julie's work and, and, and Marcelo's work. And so we're going to speak, we're going to have a conversation basically uh, between three friends, and then we'll open it up to um, a Q&A. And I think um, I've set up this conversation around points of convergence between um, Julie and, um, uh, no, sorry, around their shared interest and our shared interest. And I think a good place to start um, is something the three of us have in common, which is the fact that we are born elsewhere. Mm. So I'd like us to begin with origin stories from the personal, the artistic, uh, and in the intellectual context, and how 
origin stories that have shaped um, the kinds of things we do. Um, and so, Julie, since you're the main attraction, uh, <laughs> I'd like you to go first. <laughs> well, first of all, it's an honor to be here, and it's a real honor to share this opportunity with you. And thank you so much for participating and agreeing to be here in conversation with us. And smooth to you, I feel very indebted because um, <clears throat> this is the only academic museum that owns a painting of, or a work of mine mm -hmm. in that way. The, the Michigan State has some drawings, but this is like a painting, a serious sized painting. And that's um, a testament to your, you and really the hood, but also. To the hood. <laughs> to the hood, but you, like the, the kind of intentionality with which you did that. and. We worked together for a long time to make that possible, and um, and I'm very honored to have the painting here and to be a part of the collection. It's an incredible collection, so it's a really honor to be here. Um, I was born in 1970 in Addis Ababa, and I was born to an um, uh, Ethiopian father and an American mother. They met when he was finishing his education in. Um, at Hopkins in Baltimore, like, and so they met in DC, and within a matter of, I don't know, months, they moved to the United States, um, <clears throat> I mean, to, to Ethiopia from the United States, and then they got married, and they built their lives there, they had me and two other children, and built a home, and then within six months of moving into their new home, we left, because of the kind of massive amounts of civil unrest, and they called it the beginning of the year, the red terror in Ethiopia, and I think you can, for those who don't remember or know about that in Ethiopia, it was the um, Mengistu regime under, during the middle of the Cold War. And, um, <clears throat> and, the, and what happened really, the reason that, that you had this, rev there was a revolution. The, the King Haile Selassie was um, assassinated and, um, or murdered and at his home. And, and the entire, the revolution that was kind of, there was two aspects of it. There was the, the effort of democratization, and there was the, the <clears throat> kind of the military coup that basically t took over. And, and Mangusta was one of those um, military people. So <clears throat> it got really bad. They were like killing off all the academics, and just like everywhere else that you had these kinds of Cold War casualties. Um, in, in different countries all over the globe. So, but what, the reason I bring all this up is 1970s is right after the Civil Rights Act in the United States. It's right after anti-miscegenation laws are over, uh, uh, turned over. It's the moment of decolonization on that continent, on the, on the entire continent of Africa. In fact, the majority of the world was going through this kind of decolonization um, process, process, and Ethiopia was right in the center of that. Haile Selassie was a huge player in that effort on the continent. Um, and you had the OAU in Ethiopia, and you had my parents were part of that generation. They were, you know, um, interracial marriage in Ethiopia, but also in the United States at a time when my father couldn't go to Alabama to meet his parents, his in-laws, like he wouldn't do that trip. Um, and this is this is this is the, this is the spirit cellularly that I was born into. Like came into the world at this moment of a different sense, a utopian kind of desire of a different form of world building. And we've talked about this a lot. In the '80s, it became quickly dystopic. It went the other direction in a lot of the world. But what 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 I think when you grow up in revolution and you grow up in this moment of of a, different, of, a, of a different sense of imagination of what the world can be and what, your, what, what, you, what the kind of agency you think you can have and your family has, and then it completely falls apart. That failure and that, des that desire are embedded in like what, create, what created me. And I think those are always kind of been a part of my, my makeup, like um, on, on, a, on a real, like a small level, minute level, like, a, like part of my DNA in a way. And I think that's one of the things that has always guided like, my interest in making. Well, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I don't know if they know your yeah. story. Yeah, tell us. <laughs> so I was born in, in Rio in Brazil. Uh, my parents were first generation Brazilians. My, all my four grandparents came from Ukraine, running away from the Bolshevik Revolution essentially. So we were, they were refugees 
very much so in a sense. And um, so this notion of instability and also being Jewish, you know, the whole Holocaust spectrum was always behind everything that we did and thought about, you know. So that was something that, that shaped a lot of my, my childhood, even though I was in sunny Rio going to the beach, you know, there was always that other side, you know, the pictures on the wall of the great grandparents in Russia kind of thing. Um, that was like the altar to the past, so to speak, right. that is not going to go away because it kind of shapes who you are. Um, and, and to me, this notion of you wanted to talk about origins, and I think that's, that's so important because um, we are all after asking those big questions about who we are and where we come from, you know, and, and I think what Julie does through her work and what I try to to focus on when I, when I say that the study of science, the study, the modern study of the universe, which is actually what I do in my research, is just yet another way of trying to figure out precisely where we came from, right? So, so we, can trace, we can trace this very, very long narrative of thousands and thousands of years of inquiry to cultures that preceded science, that preceded philosophy, that were asking those questions. And they created narratives, they created stories that are usually called creation myths, where they tell a story of where they came from. And this seems to be kind of a universal urge, right? I mean, and, it, and it's kind of remarkable that if almost every culture that we have any sort of um, record of has a story of creation. You know? and, and, and they vary a lot. It doesn't matter where in the world you are, when it was done. But there's always this narrative of creation. And sometimes it's through divine interference. Sometimes it's not. Uh, it, really, it really varies a lot. And, and I see you know, culturally this effort that we now have to talk about the Big Bang and the universe, which is what we do, as just we're just heirs to this very deeply human curiosity. So in my way of thinking, uh, sometimes it's not the answers that uh, tell us how we are together, but it's really the questions that we ask, you know, that is the very, very same question we've been asking for millennia, even though the answers may differ. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we come together as this species that really has this deep curiosity to know where we're coming from. And what's beautiful about it is that this story has many ways of being told, right? And the scientific one is just one. The uh, ethnic one is a different one, and the archaeological one is a different one, the genetic one is a different one, and so we build up from this, and we create our own little, I, I, I love to think of your, your, your representation of reality as these overlaying maps of existence in many different, you try to bring together this connection between all these different narratives, and I think that's really a very powerful statement, both of our differences but also of our unity. Yeah. 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 And smart. My own story? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think my story is not as compelling as you both. But but I'll say one thing that if there's anything we we three again have in common is uh, the role of uh, military dictatorship. That's right. Uh, in our different um, countries. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so my, my, my experience growing up in Nigeria, first there was the, the sh in, the, in the late 70s, was the very short uh, democracy. And then uh, throughout the 80s into the 90s, uh, it was a topsy-turvy uh, situation uh, from one military dictator to the other, yeah. you know? And so um, you tend to understand martial law. And, and so when January 6th happened in the United States <laughs> this year, I... I had a flashback of growing up uh, in Nigeria, and I said, if you've never lived under a military dictatorship, you would not understand what exactly happened that day, you know? And uh, I remember being at, in the office, and I was trying to explain to colleagues, you know, that this is not funny, you know? Uh, but it can, there's a limit to your imagination uh, when it's not matched with experience, you know? And I think it's something I, want, I also want us to talk about. Oh. Uh, the relationship between imagination or the limits of it uh, in the absence of experience. Mm. And so I, 
so that was my experience growing up. Um, but I was also, I would describe myself as, um, as someone who was always invested in Pan-Africanism. And this is something we've talked about a lot as well, you know, um, uh, connected to decolonization, um, the role um, colonialism played in, in creating um, countries out of people who may not necessarily have thing, may have things in common, but not in a very cons uh, consanguine way when they had no, um, no stake uh, in the way in which they were put together, you know? And so, and then the, the response to that uh, at, the, at, at the time of political independence by a lot of African countries. And so I was, I've always been invested in, in how one can think about um, um, the, the, the impact of colonialism, the continued impact of colonialism and the way it sort of shaped the world that we live in. And that was my experience. And I ultimately ended up in the United States for, for studies and then at Dartmouth, um, at, at Cleveland, and then MoMA now. So that's sort of the, the long and short of my story. Um, but to um, push further, uh, um, with, with on, a little bit on the story of um, existence, which is something you talk about a lot, Marcelo. Um, you will describe science. Um, you, you said we use science to amplify reality. And I know I mentioned that um, we, we also use um, art, mm -hmm. uh, in my view, in Julie's work, to sort of condense uh, reality. And I wonder um, if there is, um, if art, is able to push beyond the limits of science, hmm. uh, and vice versa. You know, so this uh, this will be to, uh, the question for you for you if art is able to push beyond the limit of uh, science, and then in your own case, if there's other ways we can do what we do, and what does science offer uh, to do that? Because one of the things you mentioned to me early on was uh, your recent work with neuroscientists. So it would be interesting mm. to to sort of um, think about that in in the context of both of your works. Marcelo? Um, so, I'm not sure if art pushes the limits of science, but definitely the imagination that goes into, and, and I'm not talking only about painting, but in fiction in, in particular, there is no question that if you look at literature and if you look at science fiction, uh, a lot of the science that has happened in the 20th century was inspired by ideas that came from science fiction writers. You know? So they were dreaming a world that didn't exist, and we kind of made it happen for better or for worse. Right? <laughs> and, 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 and I think what the problem is with that is that scientists tend to do things because they can, without any, any deeper moral self questioning, should I be really doing this because I can do this, mm -hmm. right? And I mean, you think of H.G. Wells, right? And he was talking about the time machine and the war of the worlds, and it was really a critique to society the way he saw it happening, the technology of destruction leading to the ultimate war between humans and aliens, you know? And what saved us was not our technology, but was nature. The fact that the aliens didn't have the antibodies to protect them against, you know, Earth, which is our home. I love that. That's such an amazing <laughs> metaphor, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, but I, I see art as, in a different way. I see it as an expansion of who we are, you know, in ways that, I mean, science does some of that, but it's different. When you read a poem, your reaction to a poem is sometimes it's not very rational. You know, it's not something you can measure in any sort of quantitative way. And, and so I would say that what, sci uh, what art is doing is, is, is to go beyond the limits of science, really, you know, in a sense that it <laughs> illuminates a different dimension of what being human means, you know. And, and yes, there is inspiration that goes both ways. I mean, so much art depends on modern technology, right? You go to the MoMA, you see these incredible setups with videos and, and sound equipment, and you couldn't have done that 150 years ago. So there is a two-way relationship. But again, I think they're both expressions or, or attempts to express dimensions of the self which are not obvious to us. Mm. And I think what, I'm, what, what you're getting at is, um, it's, 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 I think, 
in a way, it's what we discussed when we were having your lunch uh, a few hours ago, where um, you talked about how the, 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 the disciplining of knowledge um, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, f a fact of modernism, yeah. you know, where um, if you cast your mind back, you know, um, uh, it, human by the very nature are multidisciplinary, you know, you're able to, mm -hmm. to wear multi, multi hats, uh, multiple hats, you know. But then um, um, we now live in a world where, where things are sort of compartmentalized, yeah. you know, and so in your work with uh, neuroscientists, um, um, can you briefly describe um, what is new for you well, in that first new of journey? All, it's not work. I mean, I do. I'm just an artist in residence at this at the Mind and Brain Institute mm -hmm. at Columbia University, and it's and it, for me, it's basically instead of going to do studio visits with artists, you do lab visits mm -hmm. with scientists. So <laughs> it's just a thrill. I mean, I'm not doing, like, I'm just like the recipient of all of this incredible knowledge. <clears throat> and it's really mind, it's exhilarating what I've learned just in terms of how these experiments work and all the various panopticons that are being built in laboratories <laughs> to study <laughs> flies to mice to, but, I think the question that the, what, what you brought up about the push of science in this and what you're bringing up with uh, modernism is, you know, like art, there's, there's there, mo European modernism really broke everything down into these categories where you have art, architecture, you know, biology, whatever, chemistry, if, if these things get um, separated and you don't have astronomers and uh, uh, speaking with um, architects in the way that we used to. You don't want to have like the, the agriculture, the farmers being involved in where the certain things are placed when certain kinds of planning is happening so that farmer, agri you know, agricultural people are not working with um, architects and urban planners and scientists. Like this, this kind of di cross-disciplinary way that we used to build worlds and that have been a form of knowledge making all over the world has been kind of broken down into these categories. And in, and in the visual arts, you had a long period of these ideas of purity in, in, in terms of the modern movement, which was absurd. And, and, and the kind of idea of eradicating culture from art is, is as absurd as, the, as it sounds as an idea. And especially when art is, the cre is, the, is a driving force of culture. So <clears throat> to me, that there's that, 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 like we're in a moment of crisis like in, in the global, you know, environmental crisis, but also politically, and <clears throat> and how how do we imagine a different possibility? How do we imagine um, what what else might be possible, and what are other places or modes of invention? And I feel like for for in the creative process, it's a it's an aspect of kind of pushing the limits of unknowing, and and really trying to work in a way where. You try to go to the most uncomfortable places, but the desire of pushing a painting or making something to to take it to this place where it becomes a surprise or a kind of phantom to to oneself, to me making it, and hopefully to the experience of of engaging with it. But it's it's to me that was what I found really interesting about your work is this place of of. Um, the, the magnitude of unknowing and the kind of and the desire of like how does the imagination bend through that and and kind of it, it, over you know years has 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 realized different aspects of our world through those through that kind of mind bending mm -hmm. that that I feel science does I don't feel I feel as artists we gain so much from those who are invent who are the people who are building knowledge and then art builds a different form of knowledge art is in this moment of it is a knowledge it is a, it is the production of knowledge but it's the production of like a visceral kind of um, it, 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 it can it can express what can't be expressed with words language or rationale or right. and and to me that it's in that space that there's a lot of room for invention and where artists can really lead in terms of um, how to negotiate 
and I mean artists in terms of all creative people, writers, musicians, artists, uh, dancers, but where we can, we, we, like I don't think any of us, even those who are studying this in, in massive detail, understand our, our, rea our reality right now in terms of this hyper-mediated social media reality we live in. And it's this cognitive confusion that we're all in this state of not knowing our, who we're around, what we're around, and you see, like January 6 comes out of this this kind of this particular environment. Or, as I was listening to the, reading this piece in the paper yesterday, we are less prepared for a pandemic after a pandemic in this country than before the pandemic, right. because of the reaction through this mediated environment we're in. So it's like all this bad information being shared. So to me, there's this. We're, who can negotiate that? Who can try and make sense of this? And in the past, you've always had artists kind of lead this, like with the invention of film and what happened with film and the, how did that change how we understood like certain kind of realities. And I think you get that in many, in many different forms. I mean, but, but to me, the scientists are the, like, they, they're the kind of magicians of the world. <laughs> And I'm sure the scientists would say artists are the magicians of the world. <laughs> but yeah. They, they show the light, though. Yeah, right. Um, so, yeah, I think um, I might go back to, so I've been, like I said, I've been, I've, been, I've been sort of coming to speed with Marcelo's work. So, so, I, so I, I'm, I'm really into him now. <laughs> so, so there's something right, he, say, so. he says about knowledge, which, which Julie sort of um, uh, is gesturing to. Um, he said the desire to know is innately human, you know, meaning that uh, we want to know. Uh, but then there's also that tension about wanting to know a lot and not knowing, yes. you know. Right. Um, and, I've, and I've sort of related that to Julie's work where, you know, it's this mass of, 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 of image, of information, imagery, you know, um, sort of um, a gathering of, of the world, you know, and so, if you're looking at Julie's work uh, at, uh, that offers so much information, mm -hmm. um, how are you able to see the, the, the limits of knowing if you're looking at her work, for example? Yeah, that's lovely. So before I answer that, I have to say this. So there is this French philosopher from the late 1700s that a lot of people don't know about called Bernard Le Bouvier de Fontenelle. Mm. And he wrote this book the same year that Newton published his famous Principia of the Laws of Motion and Gravity. He wrote a book called A Conversation on the Plurality of Worlds, mm. where there are only two characters, the philosopher and a marquise. So he already put a woman as a protagonist in the book, which didn't really happen that often in the late 1600s. But she asked him at some point, what is philosophy? And, and, and philosophy for, in, that, in that context really meant human creativity you know, art, science, in, in the context of that question. And the philosopher's answer, I think, goes right on to this because it says, all philosophy is the product of two things only, curiosity and short-sightedness. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's just perfect, you know, because that's it. That's the tension you just mentioned. Like, we want to know, we want to know, we want to find out everything, but we can't. Right, because there's only so far you can see, there's only so much you can represent, even with this spectacular way that you overlay realities, mm -hmm. that's it, there is a limit to that. There is a limit to what we can do rationally through science, because science has a conceptual framework that has to, that's where we operate within, right? And from the, the, the beautiful thing, I think, is that it's exactly from this tension between wanting to know and not being able to know that we create, yeah. right? And we create in all these different ways, right? To kind of somehow alleviate or illuminate, perhaps is a better way to say it, you know, precisely the extension of being human. You know, we're these weird animals that are capable of self-awareness and doubt and, 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 and this complicated way of dealing with where we are. We don't follow always the same plan. We don't migrate in the same routes. We, change countries in crazy ways, right? Yeah. So to me, that's where we, we come together, you know? And it's all about the unknown. You're mentioning the unknown. Yeah. So the notion of, so yeah, science is, a, is, is definitely a flirt with the unknown, right? That's what we're doing. Now, if we knew it, we wouldn't be researching it, right? And so we are flirting with this unknown the same way that you, artists are, I yeah. think, you know? 
Well, it, and then there's this aspect, at least in painting, where there's this, there's this, it's in that unknowing and in that space of, and for me, I have to actually use techniques. We were talking about if I listen to something, when I, I actually use certain ways to get a disembodied experience so that I can create without my brain rationally getting in the way. Because that, in order to really push what can happen in the painting, I have to be in this other kind of state um, where it's the, 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 where I'm not self-conscious. And, and it's that, that gap, I mean, I mean, they, and I think athletes do this. I'm, I'm, I'm sure when you run, you also get into that state when you're yeah, in those exactly. long runs, yeah. um, where you're in this flow and where this kind of work can happen. But it's in, it's, it sounds shamanistic or something, but it's actually in that zone. Like I think of intuition as this, it's, it's, it's really a form of, it's a sense, I think of it almost like as a sense, like taste, touch, smell, it's like, and for me, like somebody asked me, well then if intuition is a sense, what's the organ? I was like, the belly. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> like it comes from this place where there's a form, there's a, almost this other sense of knowing. And it's so strange when you're in that flow or in that zone and you kind of become self-conscious of it because you can almost, like with, when I was working with Jason Moran and he was composing music in the same studio as I was painting, it was as if there was a new sense that was that where I was like almost hearing my, myself working. And it was in that experience where it's almost like you're, you, uh, you understand something that you can't actually articulate, but you're making it. And so that's, and, that, and it's in that moment where you feel most like vital. And I think that's the chasing the dragon for me, why I spend so much time doing this is that in that space, what can happen in that space that it becomes completely like something that I haven't known or seen and that illuminates something else that I couldn't have done had I tried. Like, but it actually it was more potent than what I could have if I tried to think of that and tried to make it happen. So I, I don't know, that's like the, basically the creative process for me, but it's in that state that where something else is going on. And so when I go and speak with these scientists and the, the brain science, the neuroscientists, there's so much in here. Like, I think you know more about out there than what we know about in here. And what's happening in the brain, the, what, like, there's so much happening that we don't even understand. And, and I wonder how much that informs, like, when I see Jason playing, something else is going on. Like, there's a capability happening there that's beyond um, we, our understanding. And to me, that's part, something that's, um, yeah, it's that, it's that, it's that, what you described. That um, I see that in fiction. Tension. Fiction writers talk right. about this all the time, right? Yeah. The, the, the characters take their own life, and and they 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 push the the, the book forward, right? You know, and and it's at some point I, I actually wrote a novel in Portuguese uh, once, and mm. and and in my little you know capability as a novelist, but I could talking to people like Marilyn Robinson yes. and others, where they say that the characters become their own players and you are not in control anymore. They seem to have a story to tell that you're just the conduit, you know? Just, right. and, and, and that's kind of similar to what you're saying. You become, you, you're saying that you need to kind of empty yourself out of yourself in order to create those things. Yeah. But then a conduit for what? That's the question. Like, Say that again? A conduit for what? You know, that's like, it, because it's, 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 it's something you can't articulate. Necessarily. One can't. I mean, I think with writers that I've spoken to, these characters haunt them, these characters, like, but they also do feel like these, con like, I don't know how, I mean, I don't know how rational the thinking is in terms of, you know, I'm thinking of Marianne's books, like, yeah, yeah. you know, like Jack or, or um, Juliet and how, like Gilead, how do you find how did how did those characters like emerge from her? But they do like, and 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 where? Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, that's the that's the that's the but, but that's, mystery. That's, but that's also what is really interesting about the kind of work um, Marcelo does, you know, uh, because um, I mean, when when you think of think of science, think of science as providing answers, you know, to questions. But what you're suggesting uh, in your approach that. Uh, Science, science in itself doesn't offer all the answers. It just offers you instruments, and that's the word you actually use. Yeah. You know, uh, it offers you instruments uh, with which you you make sense uh, of reality, right. uh, and you, you also describe reality as 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 a construct 
that is contingent on those instruments uh, that, that you afford yourself in the way one would think of art as, as um, a kind of instrument yes, uh, of, 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 of navigating reality. You know? And I think, Julie, you do that so, so well you know, um, um, in world building, the way you build, um, build, build, build um, fast ideas around the world using image, what I call an image gallery. From, <laughs> from, from all over the world, you know? So it will be interesting to hear you speak a little bit about um, what I, I have this, described to myself as your egalitarian approach, you know? Uh, this idea that you, you draw up on an expansive uh, gallery of images, uh. you know, from the world, you know? So from structures to natural formation, you know, uh, and all of that. And, and so if you can walk us through um, what informs the kinds of decisions you make um, when, you, when you build those worlds. I mean, it, again, it's this long process of like accumulation of, of, of information, but ways of working and technology. And I think that so when I mean technology, I mean people to computers, like well, you know, different ways of actually making something happen. And I think that um, like the archive of images I pull from, usually the whole effort has been this trying to make sense of who I am in the world and trying to make sense of um, how, the, how, how I became where I, who I became when. And so the, those nagging questions become this place where through the aspect of painting, and painting, having had a history of being, um, at least in the New York art world and in the contemporary art world, there was a very, until I was in school almost, there was a very kind of, you know, homogenous people. Like mostly it was my, um, painting, and especially large paintings were made by white men. So you didn't have the kind of, um, rea the kind of diversity in the art world when I was coming up that you have now in a different way. And I think, um, being able to, but but wanting to be able to work in abstraction, which was yeah. really important to me, mm -hmm. and um, and and because and wanting to work in abstraction because it offered a certain type of opacity and right. illegibility, um, was really important to 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 also to why I wanted to work in painting. But all of that, like to understand what I wanted to do, came from like d breaking down like my my archives and trying to. Make, break down my mark making and take it down to these little parts and study them individually. Right. And then I tried to use faux science methodologies to like, mm -hmm. or at, um, um, geographical kind of projects to try and make sense of each of these layers or right. the mark making and use this approach to like study myself in the process of making. So you had the two processes of the intuitive kind of driven work and then it's the more rational kind of Cartesian effort of trying to make sense of that and then like go back into, and that's where the mapping came from in the work right. and the plethora of those images. Uh, that also provided a social context for the paintings. It's actually not moving. It's not moving? No, it's been. Yeah. All right. Well. Panic in Italy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the the and but a big part of the effort of all of this like collection of these images and making paintings derived from these images are about making sense of the world, but also about world building inside of the inside of the abstraction. Um, so it's hard to answer that question in a few minutes, but that was my effort. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, it's a complicated, a complicated question. I think to answer it more specifically about more recent work or the painting that's here, yes. um, you know, the, the social context and time that we're living in, and we're, we're, we're living it within, is what I make my work from. At the moment, I'm working on a big cycle of paintings made from um, blurred images of the January 6th insurrection. And those paintings surround you, and the kind of atmosphere of what was happening in those photographs and those videos are apparent in the kind of DNA of these paintings. But what the paintings will become, I don't know. And the painting here, for example, was made from the ruins of Aleppo, the city that I always wanted to visit that was completely 
just devastated and bombed out by the civil war in Syria. And, um, and, and the way that we understand those images is from this kind of satellites that are everywhere that use this iridium as part of like, so for me, that's, that, that painting comes from that, from this desire to try and make sense of this irrational, um, insane way that we behave when we know better. Like, so this is the thing that I get, I get caught up caught with, like we have this very precious planet, we have this very precious resources, we are such a precious moment, and we're so ultimately just us, and we are doing everything we can to destroy ourselves. It's, it's really strange. So like, it, it seems completely irrational, right? Like, yeah, um, and I think that that's, uh, that's one of my favorite topics. So, yeah. um, because I think this goes back to the question of narrative. You know, we have a story of who we are right now, which is a story which is mostly dominated by Western culture and materialism and domination over nature, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you open the Old Testament and it starts basically after everything is around, you know, God gives dominion, dominion of sure. nature, right? So, so there is a story of, of who we are that is responsible for this. And, and of course, by doing this and connecting science and industrialization, we built all these things that you show, you know, in some of your paintings, there's giant cities and horrendous waste and all that. So, what seems to me ha that seems to me kind of awful right now is that people know this and giving data or giving information about this, scaring people about this does not work. Actually has the opposite effect. Exactly. Mm. You, you, the more you say something like that, you know, the more you say you need to take a vaccine, the more people resist it. And the more you want to enforce it, the more people resist it. So how do you change this, right? And I have, I have a pet theory, but I would love to hear, I mean, if this is something that you two think about a little bit. I mean, clearly the way it's going is very bad. And <laughs> we all know that, but nothing really very deep is happening at least certainly at, at, at the political level, but even at the personal level, the choices that we all make as individuals are not being changed by this conversation. No. So, so what's what do you think? I mean, is that something that you? Yeah, this is like. I mean, I think. Uh, I think I think about this a lot, and and I go back to failure a lot. Like, and I think that even if you go back to the Old Testament. You know, the, the story of the Exodus story is fundamentally a, a story of failure. Maybe even Moses is a story of failure. And, and, uh, and the desire, like we're so, all of us are so embedded with a certain kind of desire for a particular way of living. We all, I mean, I think that's almost this universal desire in people to, li to be able to live well or to, to live better than they can, or even if you're at subsistence living, you're doing whatever you can to, 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 to live better and, to, and still enjoy a sunset here or whatever it is, the stars at night or whatever. And, what, and, and, I, and I, I think that it's shocking to me that we deny in the way that you're talking about, like we do not, we're de we are in complete denial or we, actually work in the opposite direction. But I think what leads that is capital, right? Like, it feels to me like that is the driving force. And I don't know, and I think it's, it, 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 our, we have to imagine something else as a, as, a, as, a, as a system. But in this country, we were hoping that, you know, um, Arundhati Roy, she referred to the pandemic as a portal. I don't know if you guys remember that. Like during the, she wrote an article right at the beginning of the pandemic. It was in the Guardian or not the Guardian. Anyway, it was a piece that she wrote that got moved around a lot, and she referred to the pandemic as a portal, and that we could probably leave a certain kind of baggage behind and maybe invent something else through this time. It feels like we've doubled down and gone other direction. It's like instead of trying to invent some other way of world world building or imagination right, 
um, anything like that. We'd gone the other direction of more kind of nationalistic, uh, this, this, the, when I, it, and I really think social media is a driving force of this globally, like, and there's zero control. There's zero way of negotiating that. So I don't know, what's your proposition? <laughs> to save the world. Solve, yeah, solve this little problem. I mean, one of, one of the things you, when we go back to the, to the origin story, I mean, you, you talk about um, chaos leading to order. Yeah. You know? And so might one think of uh, the current moment as, uh, as a moment of chaos uh, with the belief that something, some kind of order uh, would ultimately emerge? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, spontaneously, I, I I think we need to work on that. You know, I mean, it's really, <laughs> it's we have to build that order. Mm -hmm. I think, and and you know, I think to me, it's really about the story of who we are that needs to be changed. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. because what we have done over ten thousand years of agrarian civilization is to distance ourselves from nature and from the values of other cultures that actually treated <laughs> nature as a family, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I talk to lots of, uh, uh, of people from the, the nations of Brazil, you know, that were there way before the Portuguese were, and they talk, that, that mountain is my sister, right, you know, right. the mm -hmm. trees are my uncles, you know, this sort of relationship with the natural world where mm -hmm. it's not us away from it, but was it's us within it, right. in a way that to do something bad to it is really to hurt your own family. Mm. And we lost that. That just does not exist very much in our culture anymore. And so if we start to tell the whole story of our planet, how important this planet, everybody's thinking about going to Mars with Elon Musk, mm. which is complete nonsense for right. gazillions of reasons. You guys can ask me why I say that, you know. <laughs> Um, while really, you know, what space can do is have an opportunity for us to look back at how serious and how rare this planet is. Yes. You know, and once you start thinking that way and you start to realize that you are 30% fungus genetically, right. you know, and, and other things like that, then you start to see that you're really not away, but you're really part of this. And, I would, I'm sort of disappointed as you are with the pandemic thing because I thought if, if anything was absolutely clear is how, first of all, nature is much more powerful than we are. Yeah. Right, right. So every, everything else is really hubris. And also how codependent we are, you know, how we need each other to survive, mm -hmm. right? If you didn't have the farmers, the people driving the trucks exactly. and the trains, you know, sociologists say that social chaos is three days away if you're hungry. If we don't eat for three days, society crumbles, right? Yep. And, and, and it hasn't happened because those people were, you know. So that's, I think we can't forget though, this, and, but we do. But you know. we don't even respect, we don't even treat each other like a family. <laughs> so, 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 and I, I think that distance of, of that, what you're talking about, that distance between the concept of like being integrated and being com completely immersed in, um, and embedded in stewardship of, of our planet and, and of nature and of, la of the land. We have a project, me and two other artists upstate um, in the Catskills, it's called Deniston Hill. And it's a project that works with, um, we have about 200 acres between all of us. And it, um, it's a project, artist residency, artist lab, coll artist collective. It's making work as well as um, farming. There's an agricultural component. There's a public arts component. But the whole desire is a certain form of like stewardship of the land and, and a form of hospitality to create this kind of safe space for um, many, many artists of color from the city to have as this place. I mean, all kinds of artists, not just artists of color. We're artists of color, um, queer artists of color who started this. But you know, t when you have 200 acres in the Catskills and you have like five um, African-American artists up there living and being able to go hiking at midnight under the full moon and go to the river and have a certain kind of freedom in the land. You don't, that, that's something that you shouldn't be taken, shouldn't be something so special. And it's really special. It's really kind of, um, 
it's really profound what can happen in, yeah. uh, in that space. We have eagles' nests, and you know, you were describing an owl the other night. And yeah. this kind, to be embedded in that gives you a different sense of, of understanding of who you are. Yeah. But I also read about this in, by, by astronauts, you know, the overview effect, and what happens when you go out into the blackness which is, surrounds all of us. We're all embedded in blackness, except for the veil of the sky. <laughs> and, the, and you get this, you know, this, this sense of the preciousness and precarity of us. Yeah. And, and yet, we're just going the other direction. And I can't think of any other thing other than the engine of capital or capitalism to, do, to push that, yet we all believe that that's the only way we can all live. And it's I, there, and as if there's this binary between like a communist desire and the capitalist desire. There's so many other worlds and ways of trying to organize and participate, and yet we cannot. I mean, we can't even do a summit properly and like come up with an ag agreement on war on how to respond to this crisis we're in. Yeah, I don't understand. Right. Well, I'm, I I believe in the 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 young generation. I think they are the ones <laughs> that are going to deal with this the way we are not being able to. I hope so. I mean, there's so much more fluidity in values, you know, with the younger than, you know, so, and I think that that is going to actually grow as opposed to disappear. So I have a lot of faith. On you have that. a lot of faith on so, that and the young people. On, on that note, I think we, we should open, open it up for our Q&A. Already? <laughs> Okay, Enrico. I have a, a, a question about, um, well, first of all, thank both of you for, for the, uh, for the wide-ranging conversation, but I have a, a question about both uh, of your relationship to the practice and the concept of measuring. Um, uh, both empirical measurement, but also um, a more expanded idea of what what measuring is for both of you in your respective practices. Hmm. You want to start? You should start. Sure, I can start. I mean, I think for me, when you talk about measuring, um, it's probably I measure my engagement. I mean, I, that's. If, if, if it's, it's, I think it's, it's, I have to be very measured with how much I put myself into the work. I described that before, but um, there's so much that actually goes into creating a lot of the architectural drawings that feel very kind of labored and measured. Um, and it's, and, it, and I think one of the challenges is really to get into this space that's unmeasured and that's as un, un, trackable as possible, on, like to really escape that. That's like, I guess that's the, the mining for liberation is in there, is, is to get into the most unmeasured space that I could get into. And I think the ask, being measured and, and, the, and the actual work of measuring is, is my hindrance. I work in constant a, a t a effort against that in a way. Yeah, and in our case, uh, basically, um, the history of what we know of the world really is a history of the instruments that we built to measure that world, yeah. if you think about this, right? <laughs> and, and, and what's really amazing is that once you build a truly transformative kind of instrument, your worldview changes too. So obvious example, the telescope, right? So before 1609, every, all the astronomy up to 1609 was done with the naked eye, right? So everything had to be measured with things that did not have any amplification of the human eye. And then, boom, comes the telescope, and a whole new universe reveals itself to us, not because the universe changed, but the way we looked at the universe changed. And because of that, the whole scientific revolution followed because it could see better, right? And it's again, it's the notion of the short-sightedness that is always there. You cannot get away from that. There's always gonna be a level of short-sightedness. Doesn't matter if it's the Hubble Space Telescope or the next one that's coming out now, which is a spectacular thing. Um, 
you're still never going to see everything. So I think that's wonderful because it's very humbling, right? Because we can build these incredible measurements, uh, measuring instruments. I call them reality amplifiers because that's exactly what they do, right? They are amplifying your view of the world, of reality in ways that can be profoundly transformative, right? And so right now we need one that is going to tell us that <laughs> our story has to change big time. Right, because uh, the, the way we are dealing with reality is, is, is just very self-destructive. And not just for us, for, for a lot of stuff that is around us. So, so that's how I look at, at instruments. You know, they really, every instrument tells a story, right? And, and the story goes at, until a certain point, and then to continue that story, you need a better instrument. But the beauty of this is that there's always gonna be a precision to every measurement that you make, and the new ideas are hidden precisely below that level of precision. That's where the new worlds are hiding. So you go after that higher precision so you can see these new worlds. Mm. You know. So the, the mic is coming. Oh. You guys are ahead. I'm curious, oh, there it is. Uh, I'm the curator of indigenous art here, and I really appreciated what you said about thinking of nature as kin. In an exhibition upstairs, uh, my co-curator Morgan Freeman and I actually posed the question, what happens if we think about our relationship with land as one of relationality instead of one of ownership and extraction? And you all were talking, have talked a lot about the, this <clears throat> desire to know and to understand um, and the ability of artists to help us imagine possible futures. But what I have found a lot recently is that there's this discomfort we have with ambiguity um, and not knowing what possible futures might look like. Uh, and so I think we that leads to this kind of doubling down we have on our current you know, how we're currently acting and why this portal of the pandemic has failed. Um, how can artists help us find comfort in ambiguity or to at least be okay with the discomfort of ambiguity? And is there value in this scientifically? Um, I don't know that artists will help find comfort with ambiguity. I don't think artists, I think artists are here to create headaches more than to create, make <laughs> exactly. anyone comfortable. So I think that's one of, one of the, but I do think that, um, that, that we, I do think that there are really, um, and, and whether, whether you call it ambiguity, I, I call it also uncertainty or kind of um, instability. It's like a, we're living in a very vertiginous, kind of uncertain, ambiguous, but you know, really kind of strange time. And I think that, um, and it feels stranger and stranger. Like thinking about pandemic. I mean, there are now laws in the books on all the in all these states that deny you, you the health health public health experts to make mandates, whatever that might be. So we're really good. if we were to have another pandemic, we'll be worse off, not better off. And it will, and so this is like how we are actually responding to to this moment. So I don't I don't know how artists can make anyone co comfortable in that. I think, if anything, that discomfort should be a call to to some form of action. And I think the more like we had some of that last summer, you had a real kind of uprising and call to action, and it, because of that discomfort and ambiguity. But um, I know what you're saying about like not understanding or not having a projected future. But I think that in order to be like in any state of um, possibility right now, that we you, we have to be really attentive and to to this moment. And so I think what I think artists can do is provide insight into, and that's generally what has happened. Whether it's Octavia Butler who kind of was so proud, you know, wrote these amazing books that kind of articulate this moment in really intense ways, or uh, 
or filmmakers, or video artists. I think you have some amazing people who are really sharing what, can, what where we are at this moment. But the problem, I think, is more that we don't have a we don't have a way of like protecting and nurturing the common good. In fact, all we're doing with within this hypermediated reality, where half the world's population is involved in this, almost half. What is it? A third of the world's population is on Facebook. It's a third of the world, or half, I don't know. It's a lot. You know? It's a lot. No, a third of the world, not a third of the world, less than that. But still, I don't know how to, I'm sorry. <laughs> you got it. Right. Uh, well, if I, you want me to say something too? <laughs> yeah, she said something, I, so art and then science. Oh, yes, okay, so I think, <laughs> yeah, science gives, uh, people have this notion that science is, is where certainty is, right? And, and, and it gives you like 100%. And the truth is that that kind of science is, is old science. You know, this is like science from the 19th century and before, you know, where everything like planets go around the sun and that kind of stuff. But the new science doesn't really give you that kind of certainty. And that's why we have to use statistics and probability. And that upsets people to no end because yeah. they want to know when is the pandemic going to be over? Mm. You can't know that. There is no way you can possibly predict that because that is a super complex system and there are so many variables and unknowns that there is, no, there is no final answer to that question. So what you need to do is you have to listen to people that have acquired a certain level of expertise and, and social media does have, those voices do exist in social media, but you have to be well-educated enough to be able, and free of ideology enough to be able to listen and possibly change your mind, you know, which is a problem because the way all these search engines work is to create what I call this ideological tunnel effect, right? Where yes. the more you stay in, the more, the deeper you go in and you just don't see any other worldview and you don't even know how to listen to someone that has different opinions from you. So I would say that it's really not so much about getting rid of ambiguity, but to a certain extent, at least with more existential questions, to really embrace not knowing, you know? Because I, I, certain questions, when you, if you could, I don't think you can, but if you could get to an answer, your life would become much more boring than it was before when you're just looking for the answer, hmm. you know? And so I think it is really this old notion that the quest is what really makes it matter, right? And, and because, as long as you're asking those questions, you are, you are growing as a person, you know? And I think, to me, it's okay to have this ambiguity, you know? I think it was Tom Stoppard in his play, Arcadia, that said something like, it is wanting to know that makes us matter. And, and that, there is no promise of final, final answer to questions, some questions, you know, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't keep asking them. And, and yes, so instead of fearing ambiguity, perhaps we should be celebrating it as a way of, of bringing new, new avenues of, of being like you do with your painting. So that's why you're saying, you know, the artist is a provocateur, right? It's the person yeah. who's like, hey, look at the world upside down. You know, this is something you haven't seen before, right? And, and, and that, that opens a whole new way of thinking about reality, which is mm. what I love. You said one time um, something about the, the desire in physics to have like a uh, kind theory of, of everything. Yeah, theory of right. everything. Yeah. And, and, you, and I feel like, I might be misquoting this, but something about the desire for that comes maybe from a monotheistic kind mm -hmm. of past. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit more? Sure. Uh, so... Okay, so, you know, the way we physics, uh, we organize things is with forces acting on matter, right? And, and there's always been this desire to show that all the forces that exist in nature are really the manifestation of a single unified force, right? And people call it the theory of everything, right? which is a horrendous name, because it is absolutely not the theory of everything. It's a very small part of it. And even that is an impossible dream. But why do I say monotheism? Because clearly, you know, the notion of oneness 
right? right. The one source of everything comes very much from this monotheistic culture that has been with us for over 3,000 years. And so, in a sense, the, this drive that a lot of physicists have to find this one force that you know, commands everything is really another way of representing the mind of God through science. You know, you know, you know, that's my opinion. And if you think about it in a more philosophical way, you, know, you, you realize that you can never get there because there is no such thing as the theory of everything because we don't even know what the questions are that we're going to be asking a few years from now. So right. everything of what? It's really the everything that we know now, perhaps, but then somebody builds another instrument and makes a new measurement, and there is another force, and we go, damn, you know, now what do I do? You know, it doesn't fit in this. My everything of today is definitely not going to be the everything of a decade or two decades from now. You know, so so the whole idea is incredibly pretentious, right? And even though lots of very famous scientists like Stephen Hawking and a bunch of others have been singing this song, it is a song that if you think just a little bit critically and philosophically about it, you realize that it does not make any sense whatsoever. And Isaiah Berlin used to say this, right? That any question that starts with an absolute is doomed to fail. Huh. So. Yeah. so, shut up. Question. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Thank you. Um, so it's interesting. You were talking about sort of the telescope and how that changed our perspective, and then a few minutes later, the tunnel vision of social media in the context of um, of just sort of how it's shaped culture now, and you know January six, and looking at the Arab Spring and whatnot. I'm Curious if you two could speak to sort of the tension between the promises and the perils of technology mm. in science, in art, but then also kind of <laughs> culture, which kind of bridges bridges the two as well. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we at Denison Hill are starting a project called the Exodus Media Workshop. And it's a workshop where we're bringing different media artists, artists who work with different forms of video, film, uh, sound and social and and social media as a way to with a group of students as a way who have actually been d dealt with the system of incarceration or have been in, involved in that so to help kind of study this w this question together and it's a group study project where these artists will be leading these courses but will they will the, it, it will be like the participants and the artists will all be on the same ground in terms of trying to make sense of this, what we're in. But to me, I don't, I, I think the, these, these are big questions that we're asking, and I think not just about tools and measurement, but also AI and other, like, I don't know. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's such a big, big issue and question. I think right now you're seeing some work happening in terms of trying to, like, uncover what's really going on with these media, huge media corporations like Facebook. Um, but we don't, like, the issue is that they're, they're, so, they're so enormous and so driven by capital more than anything else. And that, that, that they know, that in, they know, they're own scientists, they know internally what they're doing is destructive, and yet they continue to choose that algorithm that's more destructive than one that's less destructive because it keeps you there longer. So if you're in a situation like that where the bottom line is just being driven by, by something that is you know, choosing money over choosing people, or choosing, you know, then you, we, we, live, we have to deal with that, like systemically. Like it's a systemic, really, really important issue. And I think it's one of the biggest, you know, the kind of idealization of the unity of the world and what could happen. And, you know, in Ethiopia, we would have these major demonstrations that were being, like, Facebook was how people could communicate in Cairo during the entire year. You had the same kind of thing. Well, then the government just shut down the internet. <laughs> so it's not like, so it becomes this thing where it's, you know, it has been this, it has been very useful in certain ways. And I think we are all, we can all go to our phones and learn about anything in any second or about anyone. And so there is this capability. But you'll see, in, in, at least in the continent of Africa, you'll see tons of cell phones. Everyone everywhere has cell phones. And it contributes nothing to like 
the baseline of, of, the, of, their, of what they have in life, of their poverty, of what. It's not, it's not a form of real development in that sense. And so, I don't know, like, it's, uh, this is something that we are trying to study through Denison Hill, through a group of artists, through a reading group, through the study group, with, with various people working on all, in all of these different levels, including in social media companies. So TikTok, Facebook, um, Twitter, um, yeah, it, Facebook is Instagram. I mean, when I say Facebook, I mean Instagram too. So it's, you know, we're trying to get, to get that to be something that we can try to investigate or, or challenge or question or whatever, interrogate. So I'm just saying the same thing in a different way. <laughs> she just said everything that had to be said there. I would say that um, it's, it's profoundly naive to think that science will solve all our problems. It just will not, right? Because there's no such thing as science. There's science under the service of different interest groups. And it could be the state. It could be corporations. And, and, and so scientists as a group, they're not unified at all in a sense of, of, of mission. You know? And in fact, for example, <laughs> you know, I guess a scientist just turned the lights off on me. <laughs> You know, and, and it's important to understand that because people have, oh, no problem with global warming. We're going to have carbon sequestration technology. will solve all our problems. And it's just, that is just not how things really work, you know. And so we have to be very, I would say, very skeptical about any kind of promise that comes from that way because, as you say, as, as you say you know, if science is serving mostly the bottom line and not the people, it's not really doing what it's supposed to be doing, which is to alleviate human suffering, which is really the noblest mission of science. You know. Wow. <laughs> That's a good ending. Yeah, I mean, I'm just wondering if it's all doom and gloom. But, um, <laughs> no, it's not. Noblest it's mission of science. That's yeah. Doom and gloom. <laughs> but in any case, um, it's really been a wonderful evening. Uh, I really thank you, Julie, for your time and for your wisdom. I thank you, Marcelo, for your time, your wisdom, your contribution. And I thank you all for, for coming. Thank you. Thank you.